hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Shut In, Shut Out, Shut Up, Disabled People and Coronavirus Post-Pandemic Church. It's great to have you with us. I'm Fiona Macmillan. I'm a disability advocate, practitioner, speaker and writer. I chair the Disability Advisory Group at St Martin in the Fields and I'm a trustee of Inclusive Church. I lead the planning team for their annual partnership conference, which is now Alleluia, Alleluia, in its 10th year. <laughs> um, today marks the beginning of season two in our series of conversations on disabled and neurodivergent people's experience of church. I'm delighted to welcome my guests for today, Katie Tupling and Emily Richardson. In a moment, we'll be talking about post-pandemic church, but first let me say something about how the session will work. Then I'll introduce the series, the subject and the speakers. And if you'd like to, and you haven't already, please do introduce yourselves in the chat. I just say um, who you are, where you're from, perhaps what you hope for from today. So let's begin with logistics. Um, the session is being recorded and will be put on the Heart Edge Facebook page after the event. To ensure the quality of sound on the recording, please stay on mute unless you've been invited to speak. Uh, do turn off your video if you don't want to be seen on the recording. You shouldn't be recorded um, accidentally, um, but sometimes if there's a sound that can switch out the camera over to you. Um, these workshops are a game of two halves. The first half from now until around um, 5.15 will be input from speakers. Then we'll move into breakout groups for around 10 minutes and we'll come back for a plenary discussion, a Q and A and a chance to share more of our experience and ideas. Then we'll finish with some last thoughts and some information about future events. We're also keeping the mics on mute today because some of us are sensitive to sound. Um, that includes me. I have Tourette's and some sounds set off physical and verbal tics. I'll do my best to hold them in because it's less painful and will probably make the session go more smoothly. But that's not always possible. And some of them are sweary ones, which I should have said. So if you hear a sweary tick, it's a tick. It's not, a, it's not me saying anything. It's not anything my brain has dreamt up. Um, but the session will go a lot more smoothly um, if I can. And it's, but it's also important that I come as I am. So I hope that you'll also feel really comfortable to come as you are too. I describe myself as disabled and neurodivergent. I use a wheelchair to get around. I live with daily pain and fatigue, with sensory hypersensitivity, with tics and spasms. After years of painful spasms, my bendy joints are wearing out before their time. So before the pandemic, I was able to leave the house perhaps two or three times a week. Fuck a duck. That also. And since March, I've rarely left the house except for medical appointments. Like all my guests in this series, I know what I know because I live it. I've prayed it. And I try to honestly describe it in a way that might help others to hear it, encourage other people to speak or to understand or to act. Since 2012, I've been helping to shape this annual conference, which is for rather than about disabled and neurodivergent people. <laughs> St. Martin in the Fields and Inclusive Church hold the framework of a space where disabled and neurodivergent people gather to share experience and ideas about our lives, our faith, about church and God. The majority of conference planners, speakers and delegates are disabled or neurodivergent. We prioritise these voices of lived experience because they are still rarely heard in church contexts. We also welcome parents, family members, supporters and those with a professional or other interest. The conference is a space to come together and find common experience to share ideas and to return refreshed and encouraged to our own context. During the pandemic, we found ourselves living in the gaps. Everything is changing and disabled people are often an afterthought. We include the more vulnerable, the less understood, 
those who think or move or do things differently. We have a lifetime to, of experience to draw on, but these are particularly hard times. Online with colleagues, we've shared experience of increased discrimination, of new barriers, of being overwhelmed, overlooked and excluded, of being shut in, shut out, shut up. Conversations like today's are rare, but it's important to create these spaces where we can gather to resource each other and the church through honest conversations. We do this not to criticize, but to inform, to empower and hopefully to be a part of making things better. This is what we believe we've been called to do. The church has been no less challenging for disabled and neurodivergent people. In previous sessions, we've explored experience of being shut in and shut out of both physically gathered and online church. During the pandemic, many of us experienced accidental inclusion. Some of us have experienced new ministry as the church has made its way into spaces long used by disabled people to connect and to build community. But these spaces are often regarded as second rate, as a less than, little less than a temporary stopgap for those who are forced to stay indoors by governmental diktat. Indeed, the Church Times very helpfully led today with the headline, public worship is banned. Perhaps the world outside church may have been surprised to find so much priestly conversation on social media revolving around the, the matter of buildings rather than people. Today, we will explore something of this experience during the pandemic and begin to move from barriers to dreaming. What might the church be called to be after the pandemic? What are the barriers and opportunities disabled and neurodivergent people might encounter? How do we share our experiences and ideas? How might we use our experience to exercise prophetic ministry to the church? These and other ideas, I'm delighted that Katie Tupling and Emily Richardson will be exploring with us this, this afternoon. <laughs> Katie Tupling was a parish priest for 16 years. Since March 2019, she's been part-time DOS and disability advisor for Oxford with 18 months also as lead chaplain among the deaf community. She was born with cerebral palsy and uses purple crutches, a purple wheelchair and a red scooter, I think because it doesn't come in purple. Katie is perhaps best known as co-founder of Disability in Jesus. Emily Richardson is on the planning team for the annual Inclusive Church St Martin's Disability Conference and has contributed to Radio 4 Sunday Worship and the Church of England's National Online Service. She's currently working on a book of disabled Christians' experience of church with Dr. Naomi Lawson-Jacobs. So Katie, perhaps we could begin with you saying something about yourself, your experience, your work and your ideas. Thank you very much. That was a glowing introduction. So I feel like I've got to try and live up to it now. So I'll do my best. Um, so it's lovely to see you all and to know that you're all here and present and gathered. And at Disability in Jesus, we have a, a, a sort of catchphrase, apart together. So although we're not in the physically same space, proximal, uh, we are together as a community. So it's great to gather the community here today. And thank you for inviting me to come along. So I am a northerner at heart with a slightly northern twinge to my accent, if you pick it up now and again, but a nomad basically ever since. I've lived in um, the, the northeast uh, in Teesside. We moved from there when I was four. We moved to mid Wales, uh, Welsh Wales, not Sheffield Wales, please note there's a difference. Uh, and I grew up thinking I was Welsh and I had no idea I was actually English. That came as a hell of a shock when I was 10 and we moved to the hated country of England who were the oppressive race. And I discovered that I wasn't Welsh after all. I was actually England, uh, English and part of the oppressive race itself that I'd hated all those years. So identity has always been quite at the heart of who I am. Who am I? Not a clue. 
Uh, I lived in Bristol in my teenage years and then went up to Birmingham for my student years, met a very um, tall, lovely young man called Chris, who I then subsequently married. Uh, and we've been together ever since, 20, 24 and a half years married. I'd have got out for murder if I'd done that instead. So anyway, it, but it's lovely and he's fantastic and he cooks. So what's not to like? Uh, we together have a 10 year old son. Uh, and when people say to me, oh, you're disabled, can you have sex? Well, yes, it's not illegal. So, but I mean, can you? Oh, you want the mechanics? Go away. So yes, we do have a son. Yes, he is biologically both of ours, but I'm not telling you how. So, um, and he's lovely. Well, I know him on social media as Wee Tup. Uh, he does have a name, but he's Wee Tup on social media. Uh, and he is my pride and joy. He's a beautiful little boy with a very kind heart and loves Lego, what's not to like. Um, and I have been a parish priest in uh, various parts of the country, uh, came to Oxford last year where the house prices are exorbitant and the salary doesn't go very far. And I now am paid part time to be a disability advisor for the diocese. We've also been shielding since mid-March, uh, not because of me. Thankfully, I'm the most fit person in the house when it comes to COVID, which is ironic, isn't it? But um, my husband's a kidney transplant recipient, so he's fit and healthy because he's got a good kidney, which is how it should be. But he's also immune suppressed. So if COVID comes anywhere near his kidney, it's game over. So we began to shield mid-March and have pretty much shielded ever since, apart from the fact that he's a primary school teacher. There's the irony. And our son goes to school. So we shield our household, but we can't shield them in terms of school connection. I have cerebral palsy and I am disabled. Different nuance in language and we can unpack that another time. The condition I have is cerebral palsy and we both get along now pretty well. After an awful lot of prayer that doesn't fix things, surgery that is quite tricky and drugs that keep everything happy-ish. Uh, and I am disabled by society and attitudes and the church. That's me. Uh, I'll shut up now. <laughs> um, thanks, Katie. That's great to hear. Um, I think you could feel very comfortable that this is an environment where the majority of the people gathered will also be disabled and neurodivergent people. So this isn't a context in which we have to explain ourselves. We come as we are and we we talk about the subject rather than um, that uh, perhaps more commonly experienced thing of um, being there as the disabled person who's going to explain and kind of tell their story and speak about disability and then have to encourage um, encourage people to think differently about language and so on. That's like, we left that behind. In fact, we didn't even pick that one up. We started in 2012 by simply talking with each other about what we have in common, which is experience of chat. Um, so thank you, really great introduction. And Emily, perhaps you'd like to say something about yourself. Um, I'm Emily, I work in church comms for a large church in South West London. And over the past eight months, I've been busier than I've ever been in my life. And yet I've hardly left my house which is a kind of weird paradox on the surface of things. It doesn't look like I've done a lot. I've not been places, I've not visited people or had those experiences of life outside my house. But I have been more connected and more engaged with the life of the church than ever before. I've, um, thanks to Zoom, I've been able to say morning prayer with my church um, almost every day. And this, which is something I could never get to in the past because of distance and my body at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, I've also been involved in things like this the disability conference. I've been able to um, preach for certain services um, and that I have not been constrained by my physical ability on the day because I pre-recorded and forgotten about it by Sunday when it's all ready to go out. So this um, 
I'd use the theme of expansion to think about lockdown. It kind of feels a bit of an oxymoron, oxymoron in that everything goes locked down, but at the same time, things have expanded and opened up in ways that were never available to me before. And that's me. Brilliant. Thank you, Em. That's a really great introduction to um, the subject for today, which is this consideration of post-pandemic church. Um, and what, one of the things I should have said at the beginning is that this is the second series. And in the first series, we actually touched on each of the subjects that we are going to be covering in the second series. So we began thinking about disabled people, church and coronavirus back in September. And films of that, the film of that um, event is available over on the Heart Edge Facebook page, which is where this will, one will end up too. Um, but I think it's kind of it's important to perhaps revisit some of that ground because you know our experience and our ideas have changed. So perhaps we could begin, um, Katie and Emily, thinking about the context, perhaps thinking about the context of pre-pandemic church. Um, our experience of uh, what was working and what wasn't working and how in the shift into pandemic church um, um, what worked and didn't work there perhaps I could start with um, Katie you can pre-pandemic I was still a chaplain with the deaf community and so it was all about the physical it was about the commute to the chaplaincy uh, and the chapels and the various places where we met and used for our deaf church gatherings it was about being uh, in close proximity to each other uh, of course in the deaf church being close to each other is very helpful when you're using bsl as your first or only method of communication so if you can't see the person or you can't see them clearly then you can't communicate and in my case, if your BSL isn't up to scratch, the nearer you can get to rely on body language and mouth shapes, then the more clues you have to be able to communicate more effectively. So proximity, being physically in the same um, space, uh, two metres together rather than two metres apart minimum, uh, was all it was about. And my diesel bills were going through the roof as I drove all over the Oxford Diocese, three counties, Oxfordshire, Berkshire and Buckinghamshire. So for me, pre-COVID church, was about a lot of driving from here to there, a lot of cups of tea that had only once made a tea bag in the whole of the serving of 40 people, uh, biscuits that were questionable, but, but, but all of it well meant. And it was about camaraderie together in the same space, about interrupting each other with a pat on the shoulder or a flick on the ear to get each other's attention in that deaf community. It was about, as a hearing person and a disability advisor, being um, invited to buildings to go and talk about tea loops and ramps. And when I was there, having the opportunity to talk about theology and personhood, and the, that's all very well, but why do you want the disabled people in your church? And the surprise to people when I turned up that I was actually one of them, the disabled, and not just one of us, the able-bodied, trying to put in a wooden ramp and not put in something more permanent. So pre-COVID church for me, for my post and for my job, was about the physical proximity of, of relationship and of fabric and of trying to comply with what was necessary rather than dig deep into who we are. Mm, that's really helpful. Thanks, Katie. And Emily, how was your pre-COVID church? I'm resisting the up of the other things that the... Um... Yes. Um, for me, it was a very engaged time. I was because I work for a church, so I was commuting to an office during the week, but not attending church very often on Sundays because by Sunday morning, I had not got the energy to join in for worship because I couldn't get there. It was about um, be, being very conservative with my energy and having to choose what events I went to, what services I attended. And it was about 
for me, I think it was about trying to keep up an appearance of being enough, well enough, energetic enough, and just like everyone else. Um, that's really helpful. Thank you, Emily. Um, I think my own experience of um, of pre-pandemic church has been quite variable. As I mentioned in the chat, um, my um, energy has for, for 20 years now has been such that I can leave the house two or three times a week. And often one of those is a medical appointment or something. And, um, and in the strange set of um, uh, priorities I've been living two of those tended to be church so I, I've kind of for some years I've hooked my life around being part of a church community um, even though that church is in central London and there's a fair commute involved in getting there because for me the church has been not just about um, the worshipping community but about the whole of my life and um, many of my friends I mean I'm an unusual perhaps in having been part of the same church community for 40 years you know, from a child all the way through um, and so it's like stamped on me like through a stick of rock you know St Martin in the field it's the it was the church that I felt called to go to as a child and I kept going because of the whole thing about practical theology <clears throat> my experience um, long term you know was different as a non-disabled person and then as a disabled person and so for much of the last 20 years, um, my, my um, energy has gone, particularly the last 10 years perhaps, my energy has gone into um, trying to make, um, um, be part of a church community where I could both get in and join in with an understanding of access as being about not just getting in the door, but participating once you get there. And so a lot of my capacity had been working alongside others um, in the community um, and through Inclusive Church and through the conference planning team to kind of create these opportunities for disabled people to get together and say, this is, this is our story. This is our experience. Um, building that kind of critical mass um, of being alongside each other, but with obviously a cost because that becomes all that you do when you put all your energy into one thing then that is the, all you do. And so I was always having to choose, like what was I going to do and not do? And um, for years I've, I've really struggled to go out two days running. So for example, um, uh, over Easter weekend, I would always have to think, am I going to go on Monday Thursday or am I going to go on Good Friday? Because the two together are not possible. And so it's been a lot about both cost and value um, being part of a community where I was known as the wheelchair user. I mean, often, you know, I'm kind of easy to spot in a wheelchair with red hair. Um, it's just one of those things, you know, we are, we are precious, but, but not common. Um, and so um, there are ways in which the, the, it becomes about the building and how far you can get in and how far energy goes and how far it's possible to participate in, in ways which are different. Um, in a place which is structured as it has been structured since 1726 with added ramps and lifts and lovely people um, and a, a wonderful um, culture of inclusion uh, but still those barriers to what is possible I think that's my my pre-pandemic chat and so I'm going to ask Katie to think about pandemic chat and in the shift to um, the pandemic over the first um, how long have we been? Six months of um, pandemic. So both in the time of everybody being in lockdown and also the time where some things opened up. Perhaps you could say something about that experience of church. Surely can. Just as we went into lockdown, I was beginning my exit strategy from the chaplaincy, but nobody knew within the chaplaincy team and the deaf church. So <coughs> it was a very odd time for me and I'm not sure uh, reconnecting with it is, is very easy because there was such a whirlwind of knowing I was leaving the deaf chaplaincy, but the deaf church didn't know, going into lockdown, uh, husband having to shield and rethinking life. Um, it's quite a blur, but looking, I'm also disability and Jesus were going through uh, what I would call a um, polite but messy divorce in the background. So May, March to May is, is something of a whirlwind of a blur. And through all of it, there was a real sense of um, 
trying to react and keep your head above water. So it wasn't about proactive stuff. It was about reactive stuff. Disability and Jesus tried to work out how we could up our game with what we were already doing online um, in the midst of divorcing and deciding, you know, who got the children, who got the CDs, who got the toaster, if you take my analogy. And at the same time, trying to work out what kind of priest was I if I had no chaplaincy to belong to, and therefore was I any use to anybody. And emerging from that March to May panic time where we just reacted and we f sort of fought the fire, if you like, coming out of it through June, July and then into August, Disability and Jesus, now just Bill Bravener and I, found our feet in the, the reinstigation of a regular Sunday service that's recorded in the week before as live by different contributors, which is lovely, and then stitched together on Saturday ready for a Sunday release. And we found that people... We only started with, you know, zero followers back in June, having lost 17,000. So we started again from scratch. And the nearly 800 followers we have now, people are engaging with that Sunday service and they're really enjoying it and saying, this is what we need. We can do it when it suits our bodies and our timetable and our uh, anxiety levels and our stamina levels. We can join in with you knowing that we are apart together as one community. It's typically Anglican because Bill and I are both ordained. So what can you do? We're creatures of habit, but it's got a real simplicity and a rhythm to it. And it's uncluttered uh, and it offers something very special. You can come and belong with church whenever you need to and whenever you can. So for me, there's been this interesting journey of firefighting panic in the early months and then settling down into, we know what we're doing with this. Why are we panicking? And what I think probably didn't help, and you can reflect on this, is the fact that what we had been doing for many years was online church. The context is online. The content is church. But what we saw with the pandemic was church trying to come online without understanding the ground and understanding the layout. And the context was church and the content was online. And the two kind of clashed. And a lot of people were talking about being exiled and being oppressed and having to use the online space as though it was somehow second best. It felt to some like colonialism. So the, the indigenous people had been there for years being Jesus together online. And suddenly the colonials arrived, not only swept us aside, but told us how to do it, where to do it, why to do it, and how it was only really second best. So the pandemic has brought about an interesting um, uncovering of what mainstream church actually discovered it had relied on and assumed for so many years and what it longs to go back to and what it longs to get rid of. By which you mean the building or do you mean um, something more widely? <laughs> I think probably we are so tied to buildings and like, don't get me wrong places are massively important because all of us have somewhere in the world that if we put on a postcard and said this is my special place we could show to other people and by and large it's not a screen by mm. and large we've all got somewhere in the world that we absolutely love being in because we are creatures in a body it may not be a body that works effectively but we're still embodied and therefore places and thin spaces on the planet are really important to us and the church is no different from that. We have thin spaces in cathedrals and tiny chapels carved out of rocks and beach, you know, cairns built on beaches and stuff, wherever it is, places are important. And online is a place, as much as buildings are a place. And Jonathan's put property when my narrowboat's moored. Absolutely, mate, and the, and the music festival every year. Places are important and the online place is still a place as much as a building is, but we're so used to buildings, we still believe that you can only really meet God in a place like a building that is solid. Of course, buildings and access are as much of a tricky situation as online and access too. So it's not either or, it's both and. That's really helpful, Katie. Thank you for that, because we, we nearly got through there without actually mentioning buildings, which I thought was quite a good one. To, you were focusing on what the ministry you've been exercising and kind of leaving the building behind, uh, which is something many of us have been forced to do. And so, um, Emily, perhaps you'd like to speak about your experience of pandemic church and that transition and, and experience in those in the kind of both the time of transition onto online and, and um, when everyone was in general lockdown, but also kind of the last few months. Yeah, um, 
I think as disabled Christians, we had quite a important role at the start of lockdown and that we were reflecting something back to the rest of the church. So some of some people, and I'm especially talking about church leaders, who never had the experience of being denied access to their church. And so it was interesting that um, we were now the experts of, well, what do you do when the building is no longer there? And they were really interesting. It was yes encouraging but also a bit um heartbreaking to see how quickly everything moved online when everyone needed it and when we needed it before march it would not it would too expensive or not viable but suddenly the doors to the church close how do we do church and like Katie said we have been doing that for years and also I found it rather interesting around um, June July when there was a lot of joy and celebration that we had got our buildings back and we were allowed to meet again and the shielders, I'm not shielding myself, but like I do, I'm in a shielding household. Um, we're like, hello, we're still here. And, the, and of course, in the last week, that's all changed again because we're back to where we were pre-June. So, yeah. So, there's a, a sense that we we had the expertise but weren't being included in the conversation. Yeah. Mm, thank you. And you said earlier on about your, your own ministry and how that had developed more in um, in lockdown. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um nothing other than what I've already said. Um I'm doing things that I've always wanted to do, but um, have been, my body had not allowed me to do. And now there is a forum and a space where I can contribute and leave morning prayer or give a reflection of the evening service. Um, my ministry is flourishing in ways I wasn't sure and didn't even know could flourish. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Thank you, Emily. That's that's really helpful. I think um, there's something hugely inspiring for other people, the idea that ministry can flourish while things are closing. So while things, some things are closing, other things can be opening. Um, briefly, my own experience was that um, when we first went into lockdown, I think I'd been on lockdown a little bit beforehand um, because I had probable coronavirus in um, February and I hadn't quite recovered. And then like many, along with many uh, disabled colleagues, we'd kind of seen lockdown coming and so we'd, we'd leapt online quite quickly. And the disability conference planning team had in fact very presciently, we'd gone on to Zoom already. I'd already got my pro Zoom account and we were off, we'd rescheduled our meetings to be on Zoom. And by April, we were we were rescheduling the conference to be online. So um, that we um, we kind of were, were riding that wave of being slightly ahead. And in many ways, disabled people, I think, can continue to be the canaries in the coal mine. We feel those, those winds of, of challenging things within society before it gets to other people. So often we are regarded as being the more vulnerable um, and the, the, the kind of those who need protection from or the more at risk um, because we are, we are in some ways the forerunners and perhaps in this too, the forerunners. So when we, when we went online, um, when we went into lockdown, 
um, my initial thing was like, I was already set up with all those things that people were needing. I already knew how Facebook worked and I already knew how, how Zoom worked. And I was um, um, suddenly back in that thing, which I've not been in for years of teaching people, rediscovering that I have a techie brain and actually spending quite a lot of time teaching people how tech things worked. Um, but also finding that after years of being able to pace myself because my body couldn't physically do things and making those choices, suddenly everything was online and therefore I could no longer have the, um, the um, argument. I could no longer say, actually, I can't do that because I can't get there because there was this sense in which um, everybody was at home and nobody was um, doing something else and therefore everybody was available. And so I felt a bit of a, a, a pressure to turn up to services and because they were suddenly available to me. And I think I had about three weeks where I tried to get to absolutely every um, service because there was morning prayer each day. So I'd be at morning prayer each day and there was Compline at night. So I'd be at Compline at night because it was there. And it took me a while to realize that actually um, St. Martin's had had these services for years and I'd never previously felt that I had to be at all of them. Um, in that time when everybody was online and services were being streamed live and there were opportunities to take part in an interactive way, um, I found it hugely comforting as somebody who lives on her own and is clinically vulnerable rather than extremely vulnerable. Um, I was shielding. Um, I've been living with the effects of long haul coronavirus as well, which has affected kind of breathing and cardiac stuff, which I still have. And those things in themselves have made me newly vulnerable to coronavirus. And so it's been a journey of finding out new ways of taking part and new ways of being church. One of the things that's been particularly valuable for me was, is doing small groups together, Lectio Divina groups on a Wednesday evening after our service, which feels very like the early church, having kind of three or four people or five or six people gathering together and listening to the word of God and encouraging and inspiring each other and offering the gift of listening. And so those things have felt like new opportunities to open up where suddenly the gifts that I already had um, have been both unpacked and encouraged and things have been possible, which hadn't been previously because energy and capacity is different in an online environment. But I think that many of us have found that there are barriers and opportunities within church and we all know of colleagues and friends and community members who are not able to be part of online church, who are perhaps newly excluded by not being able to join in with worship because they, they don't have access to technology or it's not something that works for them. And so communities are having to shape in different ways to meet those various needs. I wondered whether you might think about what are the costs and risks and opportunities for church going forward? How might church <clears throat> excuse me, how might church kind of begin to reshape itself looking forward? What, what is it the church might be doing, becoming? Katie, perhaps we could start with you. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll take the easy question. Uh, <laughs> I think it depends which bit of the church we're talking about, because the church on the margins uh, the church who was already online and working out how to be disciples together and explore faith together uh, and they discovered Jesus was already there ahead of them so how do they encounter each other in Jesus um, I think they have the ability to be agile already and to flex and adapt and to remain online and in online spaces and in different ways of being together that perhaps the mainstream historic church doesn't understand and is possibly afraid to get hold of and try. I say afraid to get hold of and try because if you were to move into a more forest church kind of way of being or messy church way of being or online church way of being, there's no money in that. It doesn't generate money. And generally speaking, people who can access those kind of things maybe don't have the kind of money that a historic building requires to keep it functioning um, and not just functioning, but fit for the purpose for the future. Its purpose being to stay in one piece, not fall apart on parishioners' heads. So I think there's probably a disconnect between the mainstream church that has perhaps enjoyed experiencing the nature of being in a tent in the wilderness and being more of a journey, um, but is still tied to the old model of being in a building that requires money spending on it and people and resources. 
and the online church and the marginal church recognizing that you can do it differently and authentically on quite a low budget um, and it may not look the same but it is still church so i think going in, in the future if there can be a greater conversation between those two experiences so again it's not either or it's not saying cathedral worship is better than you know sitting in a tree or sitting on a narrowboat is better than cathedral worship although i think jonathan l and i would agree that cathedral worship comes second to narrowboats uh, but there is something very important about the dialogue continuing what has the mainstream church learned what what have they actually benefited from in this time of lockdown church becoming an online space or in my case with the deaf church when we couldn't do online for the first few months uh, we didn't have the zoom capacity we didn't have the online capacity to be able to be deaf church with a screen then we re we shared resources we printed out prayers and readings we knew we were all reading at the same time each day daily readings and daily prayers and daily reflections it was great it was hard work but it was paper-based rather than screen-based what can the mainstream church say, thank you, we have now learned this and we'll take it into the buildings? And what can the online church say, do you know what, we thought we'd walked away from you and you pushed us out, but actually you hadn't. And to keep that conversation going, the most important conversation is, what does accessibility actually mean? Because a building that assumes it's accessible may discover it's not, an online space that thinks it's accessible will discover it's not. And therefore, the bigger question is accessibility. How can we be accessible wherever we find ourselves, whether it's a building or through a screen or through a knock on the front door? Very neat. Thank you, Katie. That's really helpful. Um, Emily, what would you like to share about the, um, the risks and opportunities, the, the possibilities going forward as post-pandemic church? Um, well, I really don't know how to follow that because I think Katie has just said everything so succinctly. It is about that dialogue and um, for me that meant me coming out of my comfort zone because before I could be a bit withdrawn but now um, I've got no excuse because I can sit here in my pyjamas and talk to you on Zoom. I do want to, I do um, resonate with what you're saying about knowing our limitations. I think there was a period in March, well, April, May, where we all got very tired because we thought as a church, we had to offer everything to everyone. But it's about playing to your strengths. And at the church I work at, we've had to, to think about that and think, well, we can say morning prayer every day, but evening prayer, we've not got that capacity yet. Or, um, yeah. But really, everything Katie said is just spot on for me. Brilliant, thank you, Emily. Um, I'd I'd also second what what both of you have said. It's um there are a lot of conversations, there are a lot of opportunities, and there are some risks. I think one of the things that um, disabled people are used to is the idea of being othered, of, of being those who are seen as different from the norm. And those are things which in society are being, um, it, it feels as though the clock is going backwards in some ways in society at the same time as the clock is going forward. So, so some progress over the last um, 25 years now since the Disability Discrimination Act became law, but actually some of the stuff is going backwards. Um, disability is often an afterthought in the time of pandemic and people are struggling with change fatigue and will often resent people who can't fit in with those um, those ways that things have changed? You know, a lot of the blue badge spaces have disappeared, or the the um, wheelchair spaces on buses are being used for something else, or everyone's wearing masks, and it becomes harder to communicate if you're hard of hearing, and um, and people that tend to be cross more easily. Everyone mental health is quite um, stressed and stretched, and we are all living with um, with through a global crisis, and that's exhausting. Um, the difficulty is that very often disabled people are seen as being difficult or demanding 
in saying, what about us? What about us? What about us? Or we can't do that. And it's very easy, I think, for the medical model idea to come back in where it becomes the person who has the need becomes the problem rather than the person who has the need is flagging up something which is missing. Um, and those things are difficult, particularly, I think, in times of stretched resources, both people resources and financial resources to discover what is it that we believe? Where are we putting our energy? Where are we putting our money? Where are we putting our time? Where are we putting our capacity? Is it a question of having something which is live and people can watch it? And what might that say theologically about what we believe? Or is it a question of having something which is hybrid, and which is both and? or perhaps some things which are for one group or for another group, depending on the, the needs and opportunities and experience of that group. And so in some ways, it's as though um, all bets are off and anything is possible, but at the same time, it's perhaps as though for some, this is a, a period of waiting to get back to where we were. And that's one of the tensions. It's both the kind of explosion of what's possible, but also the longing, the exile experience, the longing to return from the wilderness and to get back to Jerusalem. Um, who knows, who knows? I'm, I'm very open. I'm, I'm um, somebody who's enjoyed some of these experiences of finding connection because I can't get to church. And therefore what I have encountered, it becomes a blessing to me. The, the shared silences with a friend over WhatsApp messages where we simply send praying hands when we start and finish or the, the, the Lectio Divina um, gathering and sharing with often with complete strangers about kind of how the word of God is moving in our heart. For me, those are exciting things. And being here today, I mean, goodness, I've never done anything like this before until I started doing yeah. these last month. I'm not somebody who is generally known. I've been a background person um, and here I am. Um, working with colleagues to put these things together um, because I can. And all those things are exciting and possible, but also challenging. And I think perhaps we all have brought today experience and ideas of things which are exciting and challenging, things which are barriers and things which are opportunities. So I wonder whether we now might be a good time to think about moving into small groups. We're going to have 10 minutes in breakout groups. These are random groups of three or four people. Um, it's a chance to introduce yourself, to share experience and ideas. And I'll give you a slightly loose framework for the conversation for those people who arrive and go, what we'll be supposed to be doing. But this is a, a loose framework because really this is an opportunity to say over to you, it's your chance to share your experience and ideas. So. I'll perhaps begin with what's resonated from the conversations, what's perhaps shocked or surprised or encouraged you, um, and particularly begin to think about what could we do, what could be the challenges or the calls uh, that we make in our own context, um, in our own churches, or perhaps to the church more broadly. So what, what's resonated from these conversations, what's shocked or surprised or encouraged you, and um, perhaps uh, begin to think about what else could we do. So we'll be going off to groups for about 10 minutes and then we'll come back into this plenary session and have a chance to share some of that experience. If you'd like to join the groups, just hit join on the invitation that's appeared in front of you. Um, and um, we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Um, we'd be glad to hear what came up in your conversations. I hope there were good groups, um, kind of what's been resonating or surprising you, um, what kind of ideas for action that you're taking away. Um, you could either pop these in the chat or you could indicate that you'd like to kind of speak into the, into the plenary here or you could ask a question. So there's an opportunity now to either share some experience um, to share some experience, some ideas, um, or to reflect on what you've heard earlier on, or to ask a question. You could do it in the chat, or you could um, you could indicate that you'd like to speak. I'm looking out for hands. I can't see any hands on page one. We have a very reticent crowd here. This is interactive. Would anybody like to 
to share now. Oh, there's Lucy waving away. Yeah, go ahead, Lucy. I feel a bit of a fraud because I came in about 20 minutes ago, if that, and I've been mostly tidying up from work. Um, however, one of the things that I love about places like this is it's okay to be us and be late and be tidying up from work and it's and and sharing things like that with the, the little group that I was in and and um, it's all it's that's that's one of the beauties of, of a on online space with people who are or are at least aware of disability and 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 be it's it's being okay to be me and my chaos <laughs> around here and and everything and that's great thank you and that as part of online church as well presumably uh, yes we we did talk about online church sorry <laughs> as well and and how inaccessible some of us have found physical church and that it makes quite a big difference to have a space where it's actually that those barriers are not automatically there mm, yeah thank you thank you lucy um Gemma, yeah hi Gemma brown sorry i just flicked my screen instead of unmuting No, you've just muted yourself again, Gemma. So if you'd like to unmute, that would be helpful. There you go. Yeah, uh, I flicked my screen instead of unmuting. Thank you, Fiona. I would never would have seen the icon. Um, <clears throat> so um, just expanding on what what Lucy was saying, like um, for me, there's an importance of having spaces like this that are safe, where we can be ourselves in um, also kind of reaching a place about our identity in Christ and the theology of that because the we, we spoke a bit in our group about um, being told all of the things that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and you're made in the image of God but at the same time people wanting to fix you uh, through prayer often unsolicited and actually having a space to talk about my identity as a disabled person is really important and really vital and something that I've gained a lot from both the Inclusive Church Conference, shout out to everyone that was there, um, and, and, and Heart Edge. And so, yeah, thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Gemma. Um, that's really, it's always good to have the feedback that actually there is something about being in this space which enables us to bring ourselves exactly as we are. And that's both in terms of um, gathering online, but also in these safe spaces where we've been encouraged to come and gather um, in a disability friendly and neurodivergent friendly environment. Um, Anne with an E, you've got your hand up there. Yeah, um, really enjoying these sessions. Um, so I was saying to my group, but yeah, since a couple of months back, I'm not sure, whenever it was I first discovered Church Zoom, it's been really good for me um particularly being able to do things like this um and we were also all saying how it's nice that there's yeah it's a safe space there's no pressure like i'm wearing my pajamas i'm in my bed um and also that you know there's if you're feeling too tired you know you can turn your picture off you don't have to be you know anything you don't want to be you could it's on our terms but we can still interact um and i was also I mean, I, sometimes I feel a bit bad because I feel like um, when the rest of the sort of abled church, I suppose, is is having this panic and I'm like, guys, it's going to be a month, you know, we've already had however long it was, you know, we're probably going to cope. The church isn't actually going to implode if you can't all go to church on Sunday for a month. And I feel like may, what some people are maybe equating with uh, sort of saying that church equals Eucharist, no Eucharist equals bad, and that's it, and you think that's not what church is, it's not just that one service, you know, there's other types of worship, there's groups like this, there's private prayer, there's probably other stuff I can't think of, and also that me as a disabled person, the last time I went to physical church was certainly before Christmas, possibly January for a special event, I forget, ages, 
And the last time I went to the Eucharist, I can't even remember, it might have been harvest last year. So if that's what the church thinks is the most important thing, well, it's not, you know, I've been missing out, which is, is about, you know, and it's kind of, well, I'm managing. So maybe the church needs to kind of step back and say, yes, obviously that's important and I'm not saying throw away the Eucharist but that it's possible to carry on without it or you know have a period of period of fasting or what you know and that in the past people didn't always have it every Sunday and that the, the entire church won't disintegrate if this happens sorry if I'm rambling a bit no no it's, <laughs> it's really helpful and I, I can see a lot of nodding going on around I think yeah. what we're doing is articulating very yeah. helpfully something which we've perhaps not said yet today um mm. so thank you and it's, it's certainly common yeah. experience from the people um in the call today i yeah. think there's um there is something about common experience and more common experience becoming the dominant narrative and that can often be um the, to the exclusion of any other narrative which reminds me very clearly about um uh, one of the people who was key to uh, some of the disability conference work we did was the lovely John Hull, um, a blind theologian and um, religious educator who was uh, based in Birmingham, who, um, who when coming to the conference, um, challenged us and said, do disabled people have a distinct prophetic ministry to the church, which we need to fill in, we need to fulfill in order to enable the church to fulfill its prophetic ministry to society and i wonder how far something of that is being highlighted and um, reinforced in new ways during this time of pandemic and online church um, um mum nana sir you you have your hand raised yes um hello, hello sandra um i am <laughs> um yeah the only other thing that I raised in our group was that for some people, none of this is accessible, particularly people with learning difficulties, people without computers, um, people without the knowledge to use or a ability to use a computer, even if they had one. Um, and sort of, yeah, it was just it was just that as well, because I'd like both both meeting so it makes it easier for deaf people um, depending on facilities um, and also for people with you know who've got other needs as well yeah no absolutely thank you thank you for that reminder I think we did mention it in the first half but it's an important one to, to come back to because whatever we do there is no one size fit all in the same way that um, a wheelchair is not a diagnosis and so having one space in a church isn't necessarily going to work for every person who comes. Um, in the same way, um, having church online opens things up for some disabled people who have been excluded for years through being housebound, living with ME and so on. Suddenly there are many more opportunities to take part in worship and in different ways. But at the same time, that, that very same opening up is a closing down for others. And I have many friends who are autistic and neurodivergent and um, who hear voices and so on, for whom Zoom is an exhausting and stressful experience, which they, they really struggle to tolerate. And so it's important that we recognize that there is no one way of doing things because we are all, as um, we said earlier, we're all perfectly and wonderfully made and we're not made to be exactly the same. Is anybody else wanting to feedback from your group or your experience? Uh, Izzy, is it Izzy or Lizzie? Looks like Izzy, Izzy, hello Izzy. Yep. Yeah. Oh, we can't hear you though. Is your, is your microphone plugged in? Because I can see you're unmuted. The wonders of technology. We haven't got you yet. Hello. Oh, we've got you now. Lovely. Oh, I Welcome. can't tell what is this blinking, but all right. Um, it's funny given what I'm about to uh, talk about. Um, so we didn't actually get around to it in our little group, um, but I, I thought this, I've got a bit of a perspective that I think it's useful. Um, oh, sorry about that. Um, 
actually my my church um before covid was doing um doing a good a good effort of of, in, of trying to include me um and uh allowing me to participate in um in doing intercessions and we were talking about me preaching and they were really doing um making a good effort and um as soon as lockdown hit um and we started having to to use zoom um the team there is not particularly comfortable with technology and everybody was so overwhelmed and um one of the first things that happened was that any kind of volunteering just went out the window and it just became a very small group of people who was doing anything in services and my entire schedule of of, uh, of participating in services just disappeared and, I, and i'm not the only one and so in a bizarre way we were missing out um as soon as we moved to zoom and that's without talking about quality of service or how things were you know things were actually um useful or um i think inclusivity doesn't just stop at oh look we're online everything's fine now um so i just thought that's sort of important note to touch on no thank you izzy that's that's a really important point and thank you for sharing um i think each of us who are on this call today have got experience to share um some of us are more comfortable sharing uh, in this public forum than others and we've had some really um, interesting ideas put into the chat um, I don't know if anybody who's written in the chat would like to also contribute um, out loud I can't see any hands but I'm looking carefully now uh, Alison yeah hi I think just to say this is a real time where I don't think we should be doing what we did before and, and doing it less well online. I think we really want to be doing new things and things that really feed people. And personally, my passion is to do things that really engage people. Um, so the Lectio Divina groups that I've modelled on St Martin's, they are a bit different, but there's real participation from everybody there. Um, and the groups have just begun to have the confidence to start to think about the passages that they want to look at and what wondering questions could we look at and that sort of thing and i'm very keen that it, the leadership is is shared but that actually leadership is becomes almost a bit redundant because we're all there doing it um, Alison, for those for those who are watching this recording afterwards, who won't have the benefit of the chat, perhaps you could just say something about the ministry you're referring to. Okay, um, I did a sabbatical in 2019 on the crossover between um, physical church and internet church. Um, and so I've been very keen to find a new way to do things. The groups that I've been, I've started up are modelled um, very slavishly in some ways on the ones that St Martin's have which are Lectio Divina and have the opportunity for people to look at scripture not intellectually but to bring all of themselves um, to, to a, a listening to the word and then a listening to God through each other as, as we share about the word. It's not debate and I was so grateful to discover this. It feels like holy ground, but I'm even more grateful to be able to offer it. And I've sought out those that can't go to physical church in the first instance. Thank you, Alison. That's a really um, interesting ministry and engaging ministry, which has developed during this time of pandemic and lockdown. It seems in some ways has brought to fruition much of the thinking and working that you've done up to this point in the same way that um, many of us have are discovering that um, in the time of pandemic the 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 plans the ideas the things we've been working on for years suddenly have come to fruition in a whole new way in that um, that phrase which i can't think where it's from but for for such times as these we were made and somehow there is this ministry which we have unknowingly been preparing for um, for some time past and suddenly things things are needed which we've been learning to do or things are called for or we're able to 
connect and worship and pray and minister to each other, being present in a new way. Um, I'm going to suggest that we, we now begin to draw things to a close, unless there is somebody who had wanted to say a small something and had been holding back their, their contribution for the moment. I can't see any hands, but one of my colleagues will tell me if I've missed anything. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, ben has kindly been putting resources in the chat and details of future events. And I'm going to now invite um, Katie and Emily to do two things. And firstly is to respond to any ideas or thoughts that have come up that you'd like to kind of reflect or respond to. And then secondly, to um, if there's any kind of last thought or last idea that you'd like people to take away. So first of all, let's let's respond if there's anything that we wanted to respond to that's come up today. Katie. Um, I just, I'm really grateful for the sea of faces I can see on the screen and all the names that are in the boxes too. And I'm, I'm really glad that everyone came together. Uh, and I'm really, really chuffed that we all came together as we were rather than, you know, when you go to a church building and you feel like you ought to at least put the right clothes on. Uh, but actually, I'm sitting here in my tattiest jeans because they're really comfy, but they've got holes in them. You pay a fortune to have them made for you. Um, and, and probably my, my smelliest hoodie that I probably ought to put to wash, but it, you can't smell me through the screen. So I'm loving the fact that I can literally turn up as I am and be who I am, stuck the dog collar on, I look authentic, and therefore it kind of comes across being professional. It's like you've got no idea that I'm wearing pyjama bottoms, it's fabulous. So that real sense of, we, and I see people on screen who have done something very similar, they've just turned it on and, and here they are as they are. And that's, I think, the beauty of, of online is that we can come as we are without having to be judged by how we look, uh, which is really quite refreshing. I've loved in lockdown uh, and through lockdown being able to do Twitter and Facebook live due to my smartphone. I see my friends all buying kit from Amazon. I'm like, no, no, I just use a smartphone and my laptop and a, and a clothes peg. Um, and I just hang my smartphone over my laptop screen where the liturgy is and I just hit live and, and off we go. And it's agile. And I can chat to people as they're putting things in the comments and little hearts popping up on the screen I'm like oh we didn't get that in a sermon and it's really lovely being interactive and dialogue based and having little hearts appear on the screen like I see Gemma's just done thank you Gemma um, because when you're in a sermon setting in a traditional church building typically you're met with a sea of blank faces because people are in their heads going did I leave the oven on this morning I put the kettle on yet. Yeah. Who fed the dog? I'm sure no one put the hamsters out. And, and just this blank sea of polite English faces going, lovely sermon, Vicar. So online you get loads more interaction. But I have to say, I love online and I do miss being in a physical building. I, I, I love them both. Just as I love seeing my little nieces and nephews on WhatsApp video chat and we have an absolute hoot, but I really want to give them a squeeze. So it's both and. And you haven't got to spend a lot of money to be effective if you do what you can do and don't overreach and try and achieve what you're not. That's a really helpful closing thought there, Katie. You haven't got to spend a lot of money. You haven't got to do, there's no, there's no walking on water required in this. It's actually about being where you are and ministering with what you have and maybe challenging to look around and see the resources which are already around you. Emily, any, anything you'd like to summarise from what you've heard or respond to what you've heard um, and a thought to take away? Um, yeah, I think, um, again, much of what Katie said, but uh, I've heard so many people say how much it's been opened up in the time of lockdown and that has been odd to some people because for the wider church they've been denied something that they used to rather than um, some of us who are always denied that. So um, I just want to be my challenge um, churches when they do return to the building and just remind them that not everyone will return but if we get this right, if we, like you said, doesn't cost a lot to um, 
have an iPad streaming the liturgy, you'd think about what um, who you're reaching and what opportunities are coming from um, that offer of inclusion. Because I know from my experience, I have been allowed to do so much more because there has that barrier has not been there. That's very wonderful. I can tell you're a communication specialist because that was a great way to finish. You have been able to do so much more because that barrier has not been there. Uh, for myself, I've not been to, to physical building church um, since March and I really miss communion. Um, I really miss communion. I'm not saying I don't want there to be physically gathered church. I, I see people gather and I feel lonely. I feel left. I think one of the things that I meant to mention earlier on and haven't done is some of the ministries which have developed in this hybrid time, for example, including having online stewards for those who are joining the live service via the Facebook feed while the service has been happening in church and, and having that connection with people, welcoming those who join online and sharing orders of service and responding and guiding people through the service or introducing things has been a really exciting, um, there's been a ministry which has opened up for some people who wouldn't otherwise have joined in. Having said which, I think one thing which um, disabled people are often very practiced at is of accepting where we are, recognizing that where we are is not necessarily where we would want to be, but actually this is how it is. Nobody would like to be, to be ill. Nobody would like to have joints that don't work. Nobody would like to be, be struggling or in pain or have reduced energy. And one of the things that I've learned um, that, that comes in useful now is that sense of accepting where I am and then mining it to find out what is there for me in it. Um, during pandemic, I've called that the practice of staying still and going deeper, <clears throat> excuse me, the practice of staying still and going deeper. And I think perhaps this is an area in which disabled people have particular um, experience to offer, that of staying still and going deeper, of being where we are without resisting where we are, but actually being where we are and exploring it to find out what is there. I think today has been absolutely amazing and I'm so grateful to Katie and to Emily for being part of this conversation. Um, thank you all but particular thanks to Katie and Emily for being willing to come and share this amazing experience and to get us thinking in these contrasting ways about the what church is, uh, what we are, and how ministry can be transformed by the, these painful experiences of both being inside and outside and living on the edge without being left out, without waiting to be included. And um, thank you all for being here today. We none of us have all the answers and I hope today has transformed your understanding or informed perhaps it, encouraged or even inspired you. We put some suggestions for further reading in the chat and I know that um, Jonathan and Ben are going to pick those up and share them via the um, Heart Edge uh, website. And also I think you're going to email them around to those who signed up for today. Um, if you'd like to dive a little deeper into some of these ideas around online church or what it might mean to be an online community of Christians. Um, we, all of us who spoke today are on Twitter. We'd be delighted if you'd like to follow us and continue to take part in these important conversations. We'll be back next week with Shut In, Shut Out, Shut Up, um, which is um, Anne Mehmet and Bingo Allison are coming to be my guest and discuss neurodiversity and church intersectionality. Then on the 20th of November, we'll be back with Naomi Lawson Jacobs and Krisha Waldock, considering disability, church and social justice. This series is a wonderful um, space that has been given to us by Heart Edge, and it, but it's among many treasures which are hidden in the secret places of Heart Edge online series, Living God's Future Now. I know that Ben has listed some in the chat. 
I draw your attention particularly to a very a great series on being interrupted, reimagining the church's mission from the outside. I was there yesterday and I found there are many parallels with the conversations and theologies emerging among disabled people. Uh, I think the next session they have is on Monday. Next week also brings a monthly highlight, um, Sam Wells in dialogue on improvising the kingdom. Uh, his guest this time is the very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas. Kelly Brown Douglas is the Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary and author of Black Church, A Womanist Perspective and Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God. If you'd like what if you're liking what Heart Edge is doing and would like to be part of it, you can join up Heart Edge or you can sign up for the monthly mailer and details for how to do those are, are in the chat. Uh, the film of today, along with the films of the previous um, sessions, will be on the Heart Edge Facebook page and we'll, we'll also tweet it when it's out and about. So thank you again, everybody, for being part of this really exciting conversation today. We each bring something that's worth sharing. So thank you for being here and hope to see you next week. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>